In this video we're going to take a look at the bad seed challenge from the kernel CTF. The description says learn how to interact with the process and solve the quiz. And we've got a server to connect to, we've got two files that we can download. One of them is just a Pwn Tools kind of template which shows you how to use some different functions and commands and stuff. And then the other of course is our challenge file called bad seed. So we can go and take a look at that, I've already got it downloaded. It's a 64-bit executable. We could have a look at the binary protections just in case there's going to be something we need to exploit. We can do that with checksec. Um, but we have, well, we've got Canaries, we've got NX enabled anyway, so we've got most of the protections there. The reason I was checking that is this is in the kiddie pool, so it doesn't actually, these are some introductory challenges. It doesn't actually give a category to each one of them, so we don't know necessarily whether this is going to be a reverse engineering or a binary exploitation challenge. The fact that it's referencing pwn tools here um, could be either, but I mean that's kind of a hint towards some kind of binary exploitation. Um, but So we'll make the file executable anyway so we can take a look at it. We could have a look at the strings as usual just to get an idea what the program's doing. Strings greater than 10, we can see our libc functions in there, we can see it's going to ask us three questions. So it's asking us a question, a second question, a third question, and it looks like we just need to provide the answers and we'll get a shell. So let's try and just run it first of all. We run it and asks us how heavy is an Asian elephant on the moon. I'm just going to enter in one and see what it says. We get wrong. Bye bye. So let's try and run it with Ltrace and see if it's doing a simple comparison. If it's just doing a string compare and we enter say one, two, three, sometimes you'll see that it's actually comparing one, two, three to, I don't know, three, three, three. And if they don't match, it's going to exit. In this case, it's not doing that. So we need to go and have a look, a look, a uh, better look at the program. So what I'm going to do is open up Geodra to do that. I'm going to go and have a look at the decompiled and disassembled code. And as usual, we'll go over to our functions on the left. We'll select the main function where the program's going to start off. And we've got our three questions then, which we just ran through the first one anyway. So let's take a look at that in a little more detail. Um, we open it up and we see that we've got some variables. So we've got our stack variables declared here. We can see our stack canary, which is protecting from buffer overflows. And we have these variables which are set here. We've got this local 20, local 1c. We've got a few more here. And then there's some kind of calculation being done. Um, so let's try and trace this back from where it's asking us for the information. We could go and do this in GDB. In fact, we'll do that in a second, but let's just rename a few of these variables. So we can just select one and, and hit L on the keyboard, and then we'll rename this. We know this is our user input because it's taken it from this scan F. Um, it's taking the user input, so here it's going to compare local 18 to user input, and if it doesn't equal, then it's going to say wrong. So this is the correct answer then. So we'll say this is correct answer. And then we can see where the correct answer is actually being assigned. So it's set to zero here, and then it's going to be set to 1c divided by local 20. So let's just call local c a, and then we'll call local 20 b. And now we can see what's actually going into the equation. So we've got this b which is set up, we've got this a, and then they're going to be divided, and that's going to be our correct answer. So this dvar1 and local 14 isn't actually being used anywhere. Let's see if there's any... No, it's not, there's, so there's no references at all to this. Um, just there for a bit of obfuscation, I guess. So essentially, if we work out what the sum is, we'll be able to enter in the correct value there. And then it's going to go on to the second question. What I am going to do, though, is jump over to GDB. And we'll try and go through this manually as we're going through each question. Let's open up GDB, Pwn Debug, or whatever your plugin of choice is. And then we'll open up Bad Seed. From here, you can see that we've actually got an option to type pwn debug and then a filter to get a list of commands. So we can actually type here pwn debug and then we'll get a list of all different things that we can run from inside here. So these are a lot of things that you can run from outside of GDB or pwn debug as well. For example, do we have canary there? So there's an option for canary, although that might just be GDB, but that'll print out any canaries once the program's running if we were doing a buffer overflow challenge. We can have a look at our functions and see that we've got our question one here, which we're going to be looking at first, so we can go ahead and disassemble that. Uh, this can look a little bit intimidating if you're not too familiar with assembly, but um, you don't really need to know the ins and outs to get an idea of what's going on. We can see that we have, well, let's go back and have a look at our code here. So we've got this compare instruction. 
um, well, we've got a comparison that's been done here and if we click and select line 24 you'll see it actually highlights here this line over on the left one th uh, address 401 355 where we've got this jump not zero and all this is doing is it's going to compare our correct answer which is on the stack to the EEX value which is where our user input is going to go. You can see here our user input is being moved into the EAX and then the EAX is being compared with the value, the correct value which is on the stack and then all this is doing is saying jump not zero so this is going to compare those two and it's either going to come back one or zero depending whether it's correct and then this condition is going to decide whether it's going to say bye bye or whether it's going to go on to the next question. Um, so that 1352, if we go back to our uh, assembly code here in uh, GDB we can see a similar thing so 1352 this is where the compare is being done uh, we can see that it's doing the scan F so it's reading in the input it was moving the input into the e EAX and then it was comparing the EAX with the correct value on the stack and then it's going to jump if not equal to the question 180 uh, which is down here and you can basically trace it through like that so um, look out for particularly instructions. We know there that there was only I think there's only one compare instruction here, so that's was, um, that wasn't too hard for us to find. Um, and now we have an address which we can set a breakpoint at. So if we say break and then provide that address, we need to just give a star at the beginning of that. And uh, now we can run the program. It's going to ask us for an input. We'll just say one two three, and now it's hit that breakpoint that we just set. So we can go here and see that in our instruction pointer. The current instruction that's about to be executed is the one at 1352 where we just set that breakpoint. And the instruction we know it's going to execute is it's going to compare what's in the EAX to what's on the stack at this location. So let's do print EAX, although we don't really need to. We can see the register values up here. You can see the RAX has 7B, so that's in hex, but we can use P to print as a decimal. We could also use X to print as hex. So we can see that 7B. So that's the value that we've entered, 1, 2, 3. And um, the value that's comparing it to is this RBP minus 0x10 in hex, so uh, minus 16. So let's uh, let's do the same thing. Let's print that. We just need to go and make sure this is represented as a variable. We print that, and that's a pointer. So the value is actually stored here. So we'll grab this address, and then let's say print that out. Uh, we also need to make sure we print out that, just make sure we use that pointer value as well. And we see that it's 662. So let's try and run the program again. Let's enter 662. And we've hit our breakpoint, that's fine. We could step through, we could go like next instruction, next instruction and work our way through. Or we can hit continue. We hit continue and it says give me the RAND value, question 2. So we've successfully made it past the first question. Let's take a look at the second one. We could go back to the main function and then select the second question or we can just go straight to question two down here. And again, we've got our variables defined on the, for the stack there. We've got our canary to stop the buffer overflows. And then in our main chunk of code here, we have a time is being assigned. So it's grabbing the current time and it's assigning it to local 18. If you highlight it there, you can actually see where the value is going to return and what the parameter is. So in this case the time parameter is being provided is in the RDI register and the value that's being returned is returning to the RAX or the EAX. So if we were trying to debug that in GDB that's the registers we'd be looking at to try and work out what's going on and what's being returned. Uh, it's going to once again then take an input from us so let's change this to user input just so we know what's going on. We could also assign this and say, uh, I don't know, time output. Could rename stuff like this as well, just so stuff like that's not confusing you. Set that as the canary. And then we have this rand. So srand is being declared, is being executed first of all, which is basically going to set a seed. And the seed it's using is the time, which was just, um, which it just grabbed there. And it's going to call rand. So each time it calls rand, it's going to produce a new random value. But the because it's using this seed, if you have access to that seed, you can always recreate these random values. In this case, a seed is the time. So let's uh, let's rename this rand one and rand two. 
and we'll see that RAND1 isn't actually used, it's RAND2 that's being used here and it's comparing RAND2 to the user input so we could go and have a look here and see um, well let's have a look and see where the comparison is being done we have this compare and then the jump not zero and the compare is 4013FC so I'm going to go back and we're going to want to run through this again you notice there we've got the SIG in alarm clock um, so if we go back to our code there uh, we can see here that this, the, the alarm function is being called from libc along with some of these others like the srand and time and stuff like that so we could go and patch out this alarm if you uh, if you watched one of my recent videos there where we patched out um, what did we patch out actually let me go and grab the script Um, pwn, patch binary, ah, ptrace, oh yeah, yeah, so we were trying to, we had a challenge where we weren't able to run it with a debugger, but we can go and patch out the, the call to ptrace, and in this case we could do the same thing with alarm, so let's go and do that, let me, I'm going to cancel this, I'm going to close that down because we're going to go and make a new binary, so we'll call this patch.py, Oh, that was the wrong thing to paste in. And let's update our binary name to bad seed. Let's um, modify this. Let's print out the. Let me just before we do this. Let's do pretty print elf dot symbols. And let's try and run it. Python patch. We run through that and we can then go and see where we have our, so we've got our global offset table alarm, we can see our alarm in the PLT, and we can see just alarm here. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead, I'm going to modify the patch and instead of saying elf.symbols.ptrace, we're going to say elf.symbols.alarm, and we're basically just saying we want to replace this address with a return instruction, so if that's called, instead of calling the alarm, just return. Uh, let me update the comment for the sake of it and let's try and run that, let's do python patch we want to make our patched file executable make sure it runs ok all looks alright and hopefully we won't get that alarm again so let's open this up, gdb pwn debug patched and we're going to go and do a similar sort of thing. So we need to go and we know what the first value is this time. So let's set a breakpoint at that uh, rand address here where it's doing the comparison. So we have the compare here. I'm going to take a copy of this address. And let's say break star 0x. Paste that in. Let's run the program. The first value is 662. It's then going to ask us for the RAND value, so this is a little bit of an issue. So we, we, we want to see what the RAND value is there, but it actually asked us for the RAND value on the previous page. Oh no, sorry, it asked us for the RAND value right here. So it actually asks us before it generates the RAND, which, as you can imagine, is a problem. But in this case, let's just say 1, 2, 3. We hit our breakpoint because we've got a breakpoint at that compare instruction. And we can see what's being executed here. It's going to compare what's in the EAX to what's on the stack at this location. We know the EAX is 7B, which is the 123 we just entered. What we want to find out is what's here. So let's do print, and we can just go and update that. Again, just grab this stack address, and let's print that. And there we have a value. Let's go and add the star. OK, so there's our value in as an integer. Let's print it as hex and there we've got our hex value so this is the value which has been grabbed from the rand function so what I'm going to do here is just simply say set rax equal paste that in and now if we're going to have a look the rax is equal to the same value which is being compared to at the rbp minus 0x14 so we'll hit next it does the comparison, the next thing is going to say jump if not equal and it's basically going to check did those last two things equal, in this case they did so it we hit continue, we get to the third question and it says no hint this time 
can you do it? So let's go and have a look and see what the third question is asking us to do. See, so it asks us for the third question here. We'll go down to question three. And this one's a little bit similar. So we've got our variables declared again on the stack. We've got our canary here. Let's update the names again, just so we can see what's going on a bit better. We've got our current time. We've got our, again, a rand value. So it's doing srand to set the seed based on the current time. And then it's calling rand. Um, let's say rand one. It's calling strand. So then it's generating a seed using the current time and then it's calling, getting a random value on that seed, and then it's creating a new seed using that random value. Um, but it's not assigning that to a value or anything, it's just that's giving us a new seed, and then it's gonna call rand again, so let's say rand2. It's then going to assign this local 20 to equal rand1 divided by rand2, so it's actually making use of both of those random values. And then we have, let me, I'm going to trace this backwards rather than, because I don't, I don't see local 20 being compared here. So what I'm going to do instead, we'll see that local 2C is our user input. And local 1C is obviously the correct answer. So local 20, you can see here. So, uh, I don't know, you could call this like step one answer or something. It's probably not a great thing, but... Uh, yeah, so our step our step one answer is going to be round one divided by round two, and then the correct answer is going to be a step answer modulus a thousand, and that's going to produce our, our value. Once we get that, it's going to say, "Great, here's your shell." And then if we go back to our main function, we can see that it's going to call this gz function, which is going to just give us a shell, call system bin sh. So that should be everything we want to go and do this comparison again here where is the compare compare let's take a copy of this address notice we haven't got our alarm which is good everything worked as it should have let's go and do our 0x break hit continue it asks us for a value again we're just going to do one two three and then we get to our comparison so We've got our 7b up here, our 1, 2, 3. We've got a comparison which is being done with rbp minus 0x14 again. So again, we'll just do print and we'll grab the address. We'll do x star that address. And you can see actually the value is a 1 this time. That's interesting. I wonder is the result of that always one? Doesn't seem like a very random result. Maybe due to the modulus it's done. Um, so okay, well our RAX then, what we actually need to do is update our RAX to equal 0x1. And now this comparison is going to be comparing 1 and 1, which is going to say true. So if we hit continue, you'll see we go through there, we successfully, it says great, here's your shell, and we get through and get our shell. Uh, so, so we've successfully made it to the end of the program and I've specifically avoided mentioning the glaring problem with the solution that I've been going through here. Um, so hopefully you noticed that um, the issue is we don't have a flag in the binary. So the flag is going to come from connecting to this server address and port number. And because it's a remote server, we're not going to be able to do any of that stuff in GDB. We're not going to be able to set up breakpoints and modify values and leak random values and things like that, we're going to have to find another way to solve this. So I wrote a, a script to solve this using Pwn Tools, which I guess was suggested here with the intro script they provide. Um, what I needed to do is recreate the random values. So I'm just going to paste in a link here, just Googling around at the time, see if we could mimic the rand function inside Python, and found that we can't. So the random function inside Python is going to be different. Uh, a solution here is to we can have a look at the C types docs here, but it basically tells us we can import our own libc library and then call srand and call rand and things like that from there. And that's a, a way that we can basically mimic the um, random function in the in the libc library. So that's exactly what I did. Let me grab the script which I put together and I'll just, rather than, sometimes I kind of type through these things this time, I'm just going to copy it over. Let's do exploit.py and I'll just talk through the, the program. 
So first thing to mention is this is the Pwn Tools template, which I use for pretty much any script that I do with Pwn Tools. It's available on my GitHub, and you can kind of copy and paste any one of my scripts just to get the general template, and then just you know delete the exploit goes here part. Um, in case you haven't seen any of the videos where I use the Pwn Tools template, this start function basically just makes it easy to swap between debugging with GDB, um, connecting to the server remotely, and running the process locally. We've got a GDB script where we can go here and start setting up breakpoints. So we could say break main, or we could provide it an address, or whatever we want to do there. And then we just want to set up our file name, set the log level depending on how much information you want. If you're having problems with your script, it's always good to set this to debug instead of info or warn. And we set the context of the binary just so it knows that it's a Linux binary, it knows it's x64, it's little endian, all that sort of stuff. And if we actually get down to the script then, exploit goes here, we start the program. The first question it's going to ask us is that how heavy is the Asian elephant on the moon? And I basically just grabbed the equation here. Let's let's go through this as we're as we're doing it over here. So I wonder can I make this a bit more Ah, forget it. I'll just I'll just flick between the screens. Um, so question one, a lot of this wasn't actually important. Remember we had this stuff here, but it wasn't actually used. All it was actually doing is dividing A by B, and A was this 4,000, B was this 6.03, and then it was casting it to an int. And you can see right here then that that's all I'm doing. Uh, do that, I send it off, and that's our first question. Second question. We need to grab our libc library, so if you just go here and do ldd bad seed, it'll show you where your libc library is. You can just go and grab a copy of that, just load it in as an elf. And this is going to mean that we can access our srand. We also need time, so you can see I've imported time up here. And we're going to grab the current time, so you can see here, let's go and highlight the function. It's going to return a floating point number, it returns the current time in seconds since the epoch. Fractions of the second may be present if the system clock provides them. Um, yeah, we want to cast it to an int. And then we're going to use that time to set our rand seed. And then we're going to call rand. And then we're going to call rand again. And that's going to be our answer. So let me just go back there to question two. Let's remind ourselves. So we did s rand on the current time. We generated rand one. We generated rand two. And then we compared rand two to the input. And that's all that's happening there using our libc rand function. Uh, on to question three. Again, we just need to do the same sort of thing. Let me go back to question three over here. So we got s rand with the current time, and then we got rand one by calling rand. So we've got our s rand current time. Rand a is from calling rand. We then used the rand a value as the seed for the next s rand. So we can go back here and see that that's exactly the same, s rand rand1, and then rand2 is equal to calling rand again, so we do that as well. And then we just do the equation, so I've just put this all on one line, but essentially here we had these two lines, we had the divide, and then we had the modulus, and that produces the, the final answer. So, if we go ahead and run this now, python exploit, we run the program, we've got debug on, so we can see all this stuff going backwards and forwards and we get our shell. We do ls, we can do who am I, and see that we have execution. You can see all the input and output to all of our scripts there, to all of our questions, sorry. Uh, if we wanted to remove some of that, we can go and set this to info, and then run it again. You see we don't get much then, we'll just get this great, here's your shell. We could set it to warn if we wanted even less information. And that's um, that's about it. Let me just show them what we would typically do here is get our flag. So just um, because we're using that template, we can go and grab the server address and the port number. And then we would just run Python exploit remote, paste in that server address and the port number. It's going to try and open a connection to the server. But in this case, it doesn't because we don't actually have a an active server, so the CTF finished a few days ago. Um, but if the server was 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 up and running, we should just be able to run the same code against the server now that we've gone and um, put this script together and exploited this weak uh, RAND generation. So if you're using RAND, if you want to use the current time, use something else with it. Use 
the current time plus some kind of salt that you've got set up or a password or um, some other some other values to generate your your random value and that's that's it for this challenge i hope you've enjoyed the video any questions or comments leave them down below thanks